sometime during that 21 years or so, you conceived of the idea of um, applying to become a geopark. And then you talked about it a lot and it was it was sort of coming and coming, and coming and it, it didn't quite come and it, you know, and eventually it came. Um, so that must have been quite a, you know, a, a relief that you actually got there in the end after what's yeah, been and going again, on for a long time. It, it was an interesting process. Uh, it was a natural evolution, really, mm. um, of recognition of world-class heritage. Uh, mm. But it's a complicated process. It's very political. Yes. Um, and it is very wide open for yes. all types of heritage in the holistic approach. So mm. you also talk to every range of professionals you can think of, from lawyers to accountants to engineers, landowners, uh, botanists, everyone you can think of. So you learn a lot of new language on the way and mm. you find a common thread, a common path to deliver a, a really wonderful place where things are connected and people have more options than a single site. So um, it does a lot more, it adds a lot more value mm. to the entire landscape of an area. And, and that's why we did it. And, and that's why, uh, despite the hurdles, mm. and the challenges and the challenges, we stuck in there and we made it happen and got the recognition that the heritage of this area really deserves, really does. And just when you got the go ahead to that you were officially a UNESCO uh, geopark, um, COVID-19 COVID came along. Yep. So you've had an eventful year, but you've got a tale to tell, haven't you? Oh, yes. yes 12 yes. months. Well, shall yeah. I at that point hand over to you <laughs> and ask you to share your screen? Sit back, get a beer, and I'll begin. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, Keith, so beautifully introduced there. Uh, the, the journey to become a geopark was an interesting one. And um, we became a geopark on the 10th of July in 2020. Not the best time for celebrations and activities, uh, given what was going on with the world. But as Keith also says, that just refocuses you, doesn't stop you. It gives you a chance to learn new things, to learn new ways and to do new things and to think of new ideas and to approach things in a way you may not have thought of had you had the world at your fingertips. So what I want to do tonight in the next three quarters of an hour so is just show you what we've been up to. Some of it is very obvious because when you can't do other things, you talk and you, you think and you design. But some of the stuff I, I'm going to show you, I hope, will be interesting and surprising. And forgive me, I'm not going to make any assumptions that anybody knows anything about the geopark because uh, I genuinely don't know uh, if you followed the story or, or what. So what I'll do to start is simply set the scene a little bit. So if you don't already know, the Black Country is four boroughs for urban areas um, in alphabetical order, Dudley, Sandwell, Walsall, and the city of Wolverhampton. And it's based on uh, an incredibly variable underlying geology that is exceptionally rich in economic minerals. It's a very rich coal field, exposed coal field in the middle of the UK, perfectly placed um, for communications and connections. And, and when we became a geopark, we joined the club. We joined the UNESCO Global Geoparks in the UK, but also the European region, UNESCO Global Geopark Network, and the Global Network. So we became one of many territories that are exceptional for their geology and the cultural relationships with it. So in the UK, um, again, forgive me if I'm telling granny and stock eggs, but the ones that exist at the moment, there are some new ones in the pipeline, but for now, Shetland, Northwest Highlands, classic ascent areas, North Pennines, which is an area of outstanding natural beauty for the upland areas that contain essentially the lead and zinc mining areas and a bit more. Um, then moving across to Northern Ireland on the Northern Ireland 
Irish Republic border is Marble Arch Caves um, and the area of limestone plateau around it. Then we've got Anglesey, Innismon, which is a very complex geology associated with the collision zone of the Iapetus. Then us in the middle uh, as, a, as a coal field of exceptional preservation. Then going further south, probably our closest um, sister geopark in terms of what we talk about is Forest Vera, which is the eastern part of the Brecon Beacons and the heads of the valleys, the, the, the northern rim of the South Wales coal field. So it's got quite a lot of industrial similarities. And then finally, Tor Bay and the English Riviera Geopark, where the story of the Devonian period is really well ex explored um, and connections to cultural connections like Agatha Christie and the English Riviera. So, so that's our little English cluster or United Kingdom cluster. And that's part of a much bigger network which has some very active geological landscapes. So we'll talk about those today. Um, I think probably our favourite scientist, Sir Roderick Murchison, gave us the, the best quote that still stands and will always stand, I think, that nowhere in England are more geological features brought together in a small compass than in the environs of Dublin, or in which their characters have been more successfully developed by the labours of practical men. So that was said to our first ever meeting, the inaugural meeting of the Black Country Geological Society in 1841 in the Dudley Grammar School. And it stands true today. It's still an exceptional place for geology and practical people. So when we became a geopark, and that wonderful declaration that we had on the 10th of July, it's only four days from Black Country Day, it couldn't have been closer. Um, then we signed up to a, a code of conduct, if you like, a, a set of operations and behaviours that we would apply. And the committee that designated us, accepted our application, um, made a few recommendations, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, because we have to achieve these irrespective of pandemics or anything else. And they, they made seven in total, the essence of which I'm going to condense to this, that we should identify things with a unified brand, and that we should do our very best to make people aware of the geopark, get the message out there, get it visible. They also said that our management could be strengthened, there's certain bits we could bring in, the, the business sector in particular, and we could do with building the capacity because, and I've certainly felt this in the last 12 months, but as the workload increases, you just need more people and dedicated people who are not being pushed and pulled onto other things. Whether or not that's ever the case, I don't know, but nevertheless, we needed to build our capacity. The other thing they were keen on, and they're very keen on UNESCO, is sustainable development. So that you, you take actions and decisions to develop your area for people in a way that is genuinely with the long term in mind. So they feel that the Geopark is a great vehicle for this and we should do our best to integrate with that process and um, develop strands which are sustainable like tourism. Because um, as long as you don't destroy your heritage, you have an everlasting supply of income, uh, as long as you don't have a COVID pandemic, of course, um, which tends to get in the way. Uh, the other thing they asked us to do subsequently um, was to, to, to see how we could up our game for education. And uh, they wanted to know what we're up to in terms of sharing our knowledge and training the next generation using the heritage and the assets we have. To, to pass on knowledge and to generate new knowledge, to learn new things and to, to grow our understanding of this landscape. Um, and the final one really was about making sure that we talk to our colleagues across the world and we learn from them and that they have the opportunity to benefit from our experience too. So what I'm gonna talk about for the next half an hour is really what we've been up to on these things and, and where we're going with it. And some things changed even while we're in the process. So, there's a bit of a story. Um, the, the kind of 
the cutting edge of this is that we, we will have another visit from UNESCO inspectors scheduled for 2024. So we have to demonstrate our progress. We have to demonstrate that we have been achieving and growing. And so we will be revalidated. That process will begin at the start of 2024. So we, th there's an edge to this. We, we could be um, asked to do more. So the first element on that list was about people seeing it, about shining a light on the black country, about seeing, seeing the features that sometimes you don't see in the darkness. So what have we been up to? And it, unsurprisingly, when you're locked in your room, then sharing information with the new technology, getting words out, generating interesting stories and content and, uh, and sharing is where you start to communicate and raise interest. So let's just show you what we've been up to and to, to, to talk a little bit about one of the things that came in while we were doing this. So within the last six months, UNESCO announced that they were going to rebrand themselves. So this is challenging when you just become a geopark and or you've been a geopark for some years using the branding that's already established. So every single geopark across the world is now looking at having to use new logos on its literature, signage, websites, everywhere else. So I thought I'd show you what's going on. Uh, we, we're just about to start this process. So in the top left of that screen, you can see the badge that we've only just acquired, which is the traditional UNESCO, Black Country UNESCO Global Geopark badge. However, no sooner have we got that, than UNESCO has moved to the one on the right, which is now subtly different. And they want, to, to make the UNESCO bit more of an emblem than the words. So they then felt the need to explain to us all in a, in a document what this UNESCO symbology is. So, and again, I don't know if you know this, so forgive me if I'm, I'm telling Granny Ed Sucking, but if you've ever looked at the UNESCO logo, you'll see that it's a bit like a classic Greek temple where the top bit, is, is about your aspirations, reaching for the stars. It's about an attempt to be better, to, to make things better for people in the world. The steps at the bottom are about the basic human foundation, about the foundations that are so important to the planet, to people and life on Earth. And then the UNESCO letters, uh, just to say what they are, United Nations Education, science and cultural organization so so we've now been asked to adopt this in this kind of turquoise blue color and so we've just this is hot off the presses as you can see from the date on that this is our new from our uh, communications group visual identity guidelines so this is now taking on board the new branding having lots of discussions and meetings with UNESCO about how and under what circumstances you can use the brand, how you must share it, where it goes, what colour tones you can use. There's a lot of uh, technical stuff that goes into the background of these things. I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to go geeky on this stuff tonight. Uh, we're going to look at some of the good stuff. But just to let you know, we, we are getting there. We've got a new brand um, guideline that we can work to now. So if anybody out there is thinking about branding something up with the black country stuff, come and talk to us. So of course we've got all this rebranding to do. So those of you who've followed some of the story of the GPR so far, will know that we've produced some documents. We've got a branding website, we've done signs, all of which now we need to rebrand. But um, UNESCO and the global network in particular are being very pragmatic about this and saying, we don't expect you to completely reprint and re-establish signage. You can place the, lo the new logo over the old logo in some way that, that works. So we're just looking at that now. We're doing a signage audit. audit. We're looking at the, the runs of the leaflets and the electronic versions of the website and looking how we can quickly change and rebrand. 
It's a big piece of work that is. It's surprisingly complicated, but there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and we've got the signage that we've done to this point, and that's scattered out over more than 40 of our best sites. So I just thought I'd show you a few pictures of the ones you might be familiar with and the older style. So you've got the stuff that we did right at the start in 2015, which is scattered around various of the geological sites and the cultural sites. And then at the bottom, you've got the new stuff that we're working on now. And I'll talk a bit more about this later, which is robust. It's, um, it's zinc plate, which is etched and then enameled so that it is much more durable, which is good on some of our sites, and it's easy to repair should it get damaged. So, we, so we've got this lot to rebrand now, uh, and that to some degree might give us some opportunities to, to be better and to add more information, more interest to these welcomes to these sites. So let's, let's just show you a few of the sites we're looking at. Um, so in fact, I could do a quiz here. I could, normally, if I'm in front of you live, I'd be picking on you in the audience and saying, where do you think this is? <laughs> uh, but I can't really do that because I can't see you. And you, you can keep yourself mute, you can hide. Can't you? So anyway, <laughs> what I'll do then is, is just tell you. So this is Shire Oak Quarry in North Walsall. It's one of the geosites. And there's a, a variety of signs here. And there's a variety of uh, challenges. But you're welcome is the obvious place to put the new signage. And so even though we can't get out there and do it just now, what we can do is generate it. So this is working with Walsall's team, the, the new Shire Oak sign that fits with the story they want to tell, the contacts and the emergency numbers and everything for Walsall and bringing in that branding. But this was this was generated before we had the new UNESCO brand, so it's got to be done again slightly. So this is one of the signs. Another site that is probably even less familiar from that uh, particular picture is Buckpool Nature Reserve in Wordsley, just on the edge of the Glass Quarter, and just on the edge of the uh, uh, Scale Bridge and Briley Hill Canal. So there's an entrance there that's got the old kind of tombstone which is the nature reserve thing. And now next to that, we have a geopark sign, which is this one, Buckle Dingle. And this one is, is a little bit designed a bit like an, uh, a geological trail, self-guided geological trail. So it's an easy move from this sign to produce the leaflet. And um, again, you can see it's got the old style on. This one, as you can see from the logos in the bottom right hand corner was also supported by Tesco Bags for Life. So we are unashamedly um, taking money from charitable causes to to benefit our local communities. So this is one example of a, a little bit of fundraising that's paid for a geopark sign. It connects us to some of the businesses and it certainly provides a community resource for the people who live and use that nature reserve. So there's Buckfall. Next one, again, you may or may not be familiar with this, but this is Liso's. This is Liso's Country Park. Um, it is a classic engineered landscape on geology, which suits the landscape. Basically, it's Hales Owen. And Hales Owen has a particular suite of rocks, the Hales Owen Formation, which um, is a series of thick sandstones and thin clays, which literally produce a staircase topography up the side of Mucklow Hill. And uh, a very famous landscape architect, William Shinston, used that stepped topography to create a series of pools and cascades and dams. And so it's a lovely geosite. It's, a, it's well connected to the town centre and to other geosites nearby in the Dudley Number 2 Canal. And so we've started to look at these. This is just the very first outline of the, the features map we're going to use. We're generating a leaflet about the site and a walk which connects it to the town centre. And also, this site is, is also a, a new treble science site of special scientific interest because of its fungi, rare fungi. 
So we're going to do a fungi guide, which is also carrying the geopark branding. And the geopark is about all of the important heritage, not just the geology, but particularly how the geology affects the other stuff. Mm. Without the geology, that landscape park would not have been put there. Would, would certainly not have had the features it does or the uh, water supply it does. And because of all of that, it has the soil which is sufficiently undisturbed uh, that these special fungi can grow. So we've got this wonderful holistic story that we can link together and tell. So we're beginning that work now. We've just put some signage in at Bumble Hole and Warren's Hall, which is in Sandwell. Um, and again, you can see the theme and the style is beginning to tie things together now. Again, we were just ahead of UNESCO making its announcement, so we've got to do a little bit of rebranding on this. But again, you're now seeing that wherever you are in the in the geopark, as you get to your point of um, leaving your car or getting off the bus, there there should be something that is beginning to match up with something else and beginning to link the landscape story together, not just the individual sites now part of the bigger story. Okay, the one of the latest things we've done, and again, some of you may have seen this. This is at Wren's Nest. Wren's Nest has many entrances, but the, the most frequently used one is off the Birmingham New Road, the A4123, the dual carriageway from Wolverhampton to Birmingham. And um, earlier in the year, with the help of the chief executive and his funding, I don't know where he got the money from, but they found the money from somewhere, to put this new sign in for the geopark right next to the Green Flag Award, which is what that flag is. And this one, uh, the comms team didn't really want to put a lot of information next to the main road. They simply wanted to make a point that something special here, you should come and have a look. But what they did put on this one, which I think is lovely, is the red line across the centre, which says home of the Dudley Bug, which mm. I think is lovely. So, so again, there, for all we've got guidelines of style that we have to use, you can see that it's actually carrying the, the UNESCO brand from the previous edition. Um, but we can play with it. We, we can vary the content. We can, we can suit it to the place you are going to put it. And with a little bit of thought and discussion, everything comes good. So that's not bad. Now, now let's move to something that's really brand new and literally next week they are going to start making the sign for this one so i doubt if any of you will recognize this either but this is the railway viaduct in wolverhampton that is just off the stafford road on the dunstall park road the, the road where the race course is and the aldersley stadium so underneath that viaduct is the Stafford Road, and we have one of the Geopark geo sites is the Stafford Road cutting. But this is a little quarry on the right hand side where that pole is just to the right where the scrub starts was an abandoned quarry and called Dorsbrook Road Quarry. And this is about to receive a brand new sign done in that cast zinc enamel etched style. Um, I'll tell that story a little bit later on, why, why and how, but you can see here we've now moved to a style which suits somebody who's walking by, who looks at this on the fence, or looks at this on the pavement, and gets more of a story about the quarry, about the ancient desert conditions in which the rocks formed, a little bit about the river channels contained within the rocks, and then a little bit about the landscape and how that landscape became important to the city of Wolverhampton. So again, slightly different style, but you can see it's matching in themes and uh, branding. So th those are a few of the things we put out on site and we're, we're working on putting out on site now. And th there's, a, there's a rake more of these to come. I've got some money to spend before the end of financial year. So another number of the geo sites that currently don't have branded signage will have some of their signage renewed between now and next April. On the other side of this, there's been a few things going on 
in terms of adding information to what you've got on a sign, particularly leaflets and booklets and web pages. Here you can see the Dudley Building Stones trail that we did. That again is another one that's going to come up for rebranding and redrafting. That might become a booklet because they were vicious in cutting out my geology when they produced this, the comms team. So, so I would quite like a bit more detail. Um, on the right hand side is a brand new architectural tra tra trail for Halesville Town Centre. So these things are forming a kind of style that fits town centres. So this might well be rolled out into all the town centres where you're focusing on the built fabric on the the way in which people have used stone to create the architectural environment so we're working on we're looking at this one for our zone and we, we're looking at the connection with other stories uh, within the landscape right um a brand new one which is in development this is the portway hill geo site which is an exposure of the the dolorite uh, intrusions up on the round hill this is in Sandwell, facing out towards Oldbury. And uh, only a couple of months ago, the local community group based in White Heath, which is down near Junction 2, um, were asking for health and wellbeing walks, and particularly ones which have a little bit of strenuousness to them, if I use such a word, um, to get people out and about and be more active and self-guided walks uh, as an option so that people could explore it at their own pace rather than be um, part of a, a large formal group. And this site and the Rowley Hills as a whole has quite a lot of interesting features, cultural, geological, wildlife. So we were asked, could we help the friends of Rowley Hills to generate a, a new guided walk? So we went back to the, the previous version of the geological publication we did for the Rowley Hills, a thing called um, uh, Deep Within the Earth or From Within or The Fires Below or something like that. I can't remember quite what we called it. And um, within there we got a simplified geological map, which is a great boundary to do a geological walk around surface features. And this time though, we were able to bring in more of the cultural and wildlife elements and to extend the walk. So it's it's quite a challenge, this walk. But one of the beautiful things, one of the really nice things we've been able to just nudge forward a little bit with this is I've been in contact with one of our volunteers, a really, really great bloke called Matt. He's now working down on his PhD at Oxford University. Um, and he's a very skilled cartographer, really. He's done some great stuff for us. So I asked him to do some sections through the Rowley Hills so that people could really understand what's underneath their feet and why there are holes dug into certain parts of it. And he came up with these wonderful geological sections. So we're obviously going to include those in that interpretation and add these to it. So this has been happening again in the last 12 months. This again is just going, passing the first draft through the committee of the Friends Group, the White Heath Association and Sandra Council. But they, they are likely to fund this as a new walk and a new leaflet. So that's another bonus that could come out of a year in lockdown. Um, another thing that is an important thing that happened while we couldn't get out and about much was to to make sure that people knew we were here, to actually get the message out there. And there's a lot of really great people who are very passionate about the Black Country who have helped a lot in opening doors and reaching audiences that we might not otherwise think to get to. So one of those is David Ray, who is, if you know David, he's a very able geologist, Dr. David Ray, but he came uh, from the Rensnest estate and he played and learned his, his geology around the Wren's Nest. And, it, and David went on to, he's now working in the oil industry um, as the chief stratigrapher for one of these oil exploration companies. And he's got, they've got um, 
two things. One is an internal magazine, uh, which is aimed at practical stratigraphers, people who, who train to become professionals. So a very high level of correlation science. But also David is on the committee of um, the international organization that studies the Silurian period rocks. And they produce a, a, a journal called the Silurian Times. And so we've, we've been able to put articles ah. in a Silurian professional's academic geology publication and also in a professional applied geology publication last year. And those are just snapshots of it. If, if, if any of you want more of this, please just get in contact and I'll forward links and copies to you. But one of the things that really came came out last year that um, is the international community approached us to to do a paper on the paleontology, the fossils of the geopark. And this came about through connections within the network, but also through Colin, who's here tonight, Colin Cross from Natural England, and Jonathan Lawwood, one of our colleagues, to put together an introductory paper that explains the geopark and, and just just shows people how wonderful the fossils are. And so that one at the bottom uh, was the paper we, we we published earlier in the year uh, in this International Journal of Geoconservation Research. It's a new, it, it's, it's one of these international publications that is completely open. You can just look this up on the web. We, we were very, well, I was, and again, we'll see if Colin thinks the same later, but I was very pleased with the way this one turned out because it gave us the chance to tell the story, it, the whole story about why the place is special and to show some really fine examples of just how special the geology is, as well as to talk about all of the things we've been doing for the last 40 years to try to protect it and promote it. So I'm really quite proud of that. And it was published in an Iranian-based journal. So that's got to be a first, it's certainly a first for me. Um, so that one was quite nice. And then bringing it down a touch from the, the really techy, geeky professional side, we've done lots of really great stuff to just, um, ju just show off really, uh, and to, to engage local people and to tell people there's loads of things to come and see. Um, if you can't go anywhere else, you can come to us and have a look at our stuff. And so we've done, a number of these popular uh, articles in the local wildlife trust magazine in, in in journals at the same time we have an obligation to share to network with the international community and so we've also introduced ourselves in the european geopark network with publications to um just saying who we are and what we get up to and uh please come and see us as and when this is all over so we've done quite a bit of that kind of showing the world where we are. And um, if some of you have been unlucky enough to read the Facebook stuff I've been doing, you'll realize we did 500 daily posts through the worst of it, uh, 500 separate stories about things geological and cultural related to geology uh, in the black country over the worst of it. That stuff isn't, one of the things I don't like about social media is that the people who run it tell you that you, you literally are 12 seconds worth of interest. I don't believe that. You are if the stuff you generate disappears into oblivion. But if you do what we did, which is generate these one page standalone stories that are factual, content rich, nice images, and you keep them as an archive and you you eventually feed them into the web or feed them into other publications or teaching products. Then you have a phenomenal resource of storytelling, beautiful images and all kinds of connections in a data set like this. So although it was done for a specific purpose to keep people engaged with us, to give people some options for local things to see and do when they can't do anything else, it actually has generated a huge content for us to go forward on. So this is this is a particularly good resource of interest. Um, and then we finally, in the last few months, started to see people again and take them out on some of the walks where maybe 
uh, people wouldn't think to go for geology. So, for example, Bumble Hole, this one. You know, Bumble Hole is one we, I don't think we as a society had ever taken a geological field trip to until this year. But I was asked by um, adult and community learning if I could do it. So I put one together and it was fascinating and great. And then some of you may have come along to the stuff that Andy and I organised in the summer and, and joined us in this uh, field trip to Bumble Hole. And it then, because it was, it seemed to be an engaging place to take people, it then turned into part of the uh, joint exchange trip we did as a quid pro quo with the Dorset Geology Group um, a couple of months back. So we started to do some really interesting re revisits to the Black Country sites and the Black Country landscapes that we probably first did 40 years ago in this society. Um, we haven't been shy of the TV either. So um, some of you may have witnessed a few weeks ago that um, BBC Midlands today, in, in I think it was the last week of the summer holidays, did something about um, beautiful things on your doorstep that are worth having a look at. And, uh, and we got Mary Rhodes and the BBC uh, Midlands Today team up on Wren's Nest, um, having a look at the Wren's Nest and talking a bit about the geopark. So that was, that was a nice bit of publicity. Um, everything I've talked to you about really is the stuff we as adults would enjoy. But there's a danger that we could disengage the young people who do things in a very technological way or in a very different visual learning way to the way we might. So one of the things we've, we've been looking at in this last 12 months as well is how we can use new technology to explore places. And some of you may have seen this appear on the website probably more than 12 months ago. But we've done a little bit of development with this and we're taking this forward with a few ideas in the near future. So this literally, we, we mapped digitally the Dudley Museum as the headquarters of the geopark and made it a virtual experience. You can explore this and you can look at what we've got on display online through the portal of the, the PC. So for the kids who like to explore or use the virtual world, they've got a chance to at least be introduced to the places that we've got uh, as a place they might want to visit in the future. So we've done it with a museum um, and a virtual museum, but we've also been experimenting outside as well. So the Red House Cone has got a slightly different take on this, where there's a self-guided virtual reality tour around the historic site. So as you go in, you point your phone at these white panels, like at number 12 you can see there, and scan the, the panel. It recognises the image of the panel. You don't need a QR code or a website address. It recognises the panel. It sees the picture and recognises the picture. And then it will talk to you, or it will give you a bit of live video or it'll give you a three-dimensional image or a bit of a uh, historic footage. So that's another way of using new technology uh, or maybe getting people who wouldn't read a text panel to watch a video online by simply taking the phone with them or maybe being able to enrich their experience through this idea of technology. At the same time, we've put a little exhibition in the Red House Cone about the geopark and about the the minerals that we use to give glass its colour and texture. In the middle, you can see virtual reality, um, a virtual solar system that you can dis discover by walking around Walsall Arboretum. So that is one of these um, kind of a Pokemon type thing, but it's actually with a bit more substance. So you can walk around the Arboretum and discover the planets in a distance from the sun and a little bit of information about the planets as you go. So that's, we've done slightly more fun things with Sandwell, with dinosaurs in the Sandwell Valley and things like that. But this, this idea of virtual worlds 
can be balanced and can be used as an introduction to a deeper understanding, a deeper meaning of the landscape. So, so we are working on that. We're very much at the front end of this and learning it. And I mean, people like me are ancient. I'm finding some of the tech quite challenging. But for the kids or, you know, your nephew who's five years old, they'll just pick it up and say, this is what you should be doing. So, so I think there's a, there's a balance to be struck here. And as long as it's content rich, how you deliver that content can still enrich the experience of visiting a site like this. So we've been playing with that. So that ticks the box for how we've been trying to make people aware of the geopark, share the wonders of the geopark, and be visible to more people. But the, if you remember on that list at the start, one of the things that they were wanted to be us to be aware of was that it's going to grow, it's going to get wings, and you're going to be overwhelmed with work and inquiry. And that started. So we're very much the buds at the start of a growing season, really, with this year park. Um, and so we were asked what we we're going to do to grow the capacity, how we were going to cope with the future. Well, one of the important things is that we've begun this process of designing the future and looking at the functions and the people we're going to need to deliver on promises and to make sure that we keep moving forward, keep everyone engaged. Um, it, it's easy when everybody's locked away inside to lose the communication and lose the flow of the work. So this is a proposal of a staff structure that we're trying to put in place and trying to resource. We've got all of the necessary approvals. We've just got to work out how to do it and who's going to pay for it. Just the easy bit. So, so within this, Dudley is accepted as the lead partner within the geopark. They've got a geologist, they've got a museum of geology, they've got a lot of knowledge based around geodesy in the, the green teams. That will and has to be very strongly associated within the museum. That is a fundamental rule within the geopark network that there is a strong museum connection so that you've got someone who understands the, the real importance of the geological heritage. That will work very closely with the new geopark team. So the museum link is there. The other thing that's absolutely fundamental with heritage is that you have the mechanisms to engage people with it, which is often the tourism and hospitality sector. So you can understand in that blue set of boxes, the team needs to work together within those key areas of work to fully understand the consequences of the decisions that are being made on the ground. But then you need to get things done. It's all very well talking about it, making strategic decisions. You've got to do stuff. And so the people that we want to put in place and recruit as dedicated to are somebody who focus full time on this, a lead person, somebody who has the, the wider vision, who sees the connections, who can do the tricky stuff when you're talking to powerful people and uh, people with influence. Working with that person, you need the key roles of the gopher, the people who can sort the stuff out, who, can, who know the rules, who can work out the procedures and processes and politics. People who, who can handle the money side of things, who can chase things, who can build business cases, who, can, who are good at putting bids together to get grants, uh, successfully delivering projects on the ground. And increasingly, a person who monitors the outcomes of the work, who can show the impact, who can demonstrate the value, and then, of course, the other side to this is sharing and learning and training and benefiting with skills. So there's an education angle to this, a really important skills and learning side to this. So that little team will take what we've got now, which is people who are contributing when they can and how they can under the guidance of somebody like me as the current coordinator would suddenly have people dedicated who can really push this forward and really start to generate some connections. So 
that's where we're going with this. And this, there's been a lot of talk in the background about how we deliver this, who we deliver this, where the structure is, how much it's going to cost, how they're going to be based, it, where and how they'll function. So putting a new team together to do work that's never been done before requires a lot of discussions with the people who are going to provide it. Um, we'll leave that one there. Um, the, uh, so the, the, that's really exciting because when that happens, that things will really start to accelerate. Um, right, back to the list at the start. The other point three out of five, I think it was, was about sustainable development. It can't have avoided anybody's attention that the world environment and the impact of people, humans, is increasingly being looked at in terms of its uh, wastefulness or sustainability or gentleness. And so UNESCO are really ramping up this environmental end of things and this um, climate change in particular, climate adaptation. So hence the, how are you going to integrate and how are you going to influence development so that it becomes more sustainable? So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of what we've been up to um, on that one. Probably the most important thing of all that we've done is almost definitely the most boring thing of all that we've done, which is to, to painstakingly read the Black Country Plan. And I don't know if any of you guys have done this, but this is a monumental document because it is a vision for strategic decision making to develop the Black Country all the way through to 2039. So there's a huge amount of evidence in the background, spatial mapping of things, relate, we're looking at impacts and consequences to different decisions. Within there though, because of the us achieving the accolade, we now have specific policy, which specifically names the geopark and specifically puts into the regional context geoconservation and geodiversity for the first time and probably the first UK area to have this. So when we started that game and we were suggesting what they should put in, we simply asked them to, in, in that line underneath, you can see it says require developers to seek to make a positive contribution. It's quite soft, that word, to seek to make a contribution to the protection and enhancement the view and specifically to the nominated geosites of the geopark. Our ambition was influence. Um, you catch more wasps with sweet than sour. It's a bad simile, but you know what I mean. So to be a friend within the development process that delivers more value, that adds value. What came out of it was a lot better from the planners. Here's the policy. This is the draft policy was subject to consultation until last Monday, the consultation finished. And within there, there's a whole section on the geopark under ENV Environmental Policy 6. And this is Environmental Policy 6 as proposed. So I won't go through it in detail, but you can see that it's now making it a material planning thought process for developers so that they, wherever possible, have to make a positive contribution and protect, and that their development will, in, under clause B, be resisted should there be any significant adverse impacts on key geological sites. So you can see that they've really ramped the wording up from a seek to make a positive contribution to thou shalt. <laughs> So we are very, very happy with this. Um, I haven't heard yet. There's quite a period of going through the, the comments on the plan. Whether anybody at all objected to this, but the QT was nobody was really bothered about this part of the plan. So with a bit of luck, but this will go through and become formal policy in due course. But it is bespoke. Black Country UNESCO Global Geopark Policy. So we're heading to that. Very pleased with that. 
Um, and so what, what does that mean we can do more of? What does that mean we can, how can we benefit the heritage and how can we benefit the, the new knowledge, learning new things, adding value to all of this wonderful stuff in the Newport? Well, I'll just give you a couple of examples, some of which you may have heard of, some of which you might have seen. So um, back in 2019, the redevelopment of the derelict areas, the old landfill sites and everything on the side of Castle Hill began in earnest. And one of the projects there, and there's two that are important, but bringing in the, the light railway, the tramway, the middle metro, connects in an important way areas of the black country. But there's also this thing that was going on. This is not the middle of metro. This is a thing called the Very Light Rail Innovation Centre, test track and retaining wall, the retaining wall, which is for the middle of metro. So they dug out a fair chunk of the side of Castle Hill while they were getting rid of all the uh, less than pleasant material. And we got access to look at that and to map. Now, if you know anything about the geology of Castle Hill, you think of it as a simple fold in the rocks. It didn't. And when they dug this section out, we had a closer look at this middle section here. And down here, you can see that instead of it being rocks sloping away from the hill towards you as the viewer, the rocks were bent in all sorts of different directions, and there's a fault zone in the middle. And there are horizontal layers here too. But what is very useful to geology is the fact that some of those layers are potentially datable bentonite layers. So we've got 10 more bentonites. And within the intervening shales, the stuff that was there too, the low up the formation material, there is a ton of fossils that we were able to, in a very short period in 2020, route through and get some really cracking material. The one in the middle there, the stripy one that looks like a rod with stripes on it, is a fossil squid shell, a cephalopod. And there's a colleague of ours, Natural England at the moment, who, who's going through all of that stuff that we found and doing a bit of research on that. So this is again, the new knowledge is two great examples of new knowledge. Totally unexpected geological structure and new fossil assemblages that we can get and study and add to the collections going forward. Another site that came up is up for development, Ketley Quarry. One corner of Ketley Quarry is Trevor Sign for the contact between the Truria Formation through the Moles and the overlying um, Hail Zone Formation. And as a soft sediment site, this is very difficult to keep in good nick and, and accessible. Uh, but working with the developers on this one, they reprofiled the entire site for us and stepped it so that we can have good access and close-up access, not only for studying this site, in particular, these layers here, uh, the pale layers are fossil soils and these white vertical stripes are fossil root zones, but it, we've also got a fault, a geological fault exposed now, and it's all safe and accessible. The area around it was shaped to allow it to be a natural amphitheater so that a school group can see it from a distance. And then we've zigzagged this path up the uh, face in a way that we can work on it with hand tools to keep it clean, but also it's very safe and accessible for study. So that's another one, that's Ketley Quarry. But this is the one I referred to earlier with that new sign, Gorsebrook Road. And this site is changing its use from a derelict landfill site with a gas flow um, to a hard standing area. And when, when Wolverhampton started to look at this, they realised that the query is about it being a, a, a scheduled geological site within the geopark. It isn't, but it is adjacent to the Stafford Road geosite. So we got involved with the planners there to talk about this site and the development that was planned. And um, in doing that, while they were messing about to work out, to, to clear the site, I simply just asked them, would they mind clearing the rock face? They've got the machines, they've got the guys. They said no, because that wasn't part of the contract they were paying for. Then lo and behold, a week later, they told me to come back out to site. And what happened was 
this was the rock face and this is the rock face now. Um, this is the one that they're paying for that sign to go on the um, the outside of the site, the where the the, the road goes past, um, and it's all been paid for by the development here uh, to welcome people in. And in the process of doing that, we are, we were allowed into to do this detailed log and to look at a series of stacked river channels that we didn't know were there. So again, the the way that site will be developed will be temporary usage and there will be accessible rock faces from this point on. The the hazards of the landfill have been taken to one side and got out of the way. So, so this is a real positive uh, outcome and it engaged the planners. Coming to the end of the talk now, you'll be glad to hear. Um, a few other things I just wanted to mention that they're in development. So there's a virtual reality scan been done earlier this year of the entire cavern system that you may have gone into on a boat. That has multiple uses. I won't talk about this project much tonight, but it gives us precision, millimeter precision of the brickwork, of the geology, of everything, so that we can use it as a safety tool going forward to see if anything moves, or from a safe distance where you can't get up a ladder 30 feet up into the cavern, study the fossils on the rock faces. So this, this is really exciting. This is brand new stuff. It took some doing, uh, but it's in place now. Um, one thing I must mention, if I, if I tell you nothing else, uh, another one of the great where hey moments was um, Saltwell's local nature reserve became a national nature reserve for its geology last year and in doing that it becomes the newest geological national nature reserve in the UK. On top of that it got an actual permanent warden space and teaching space put adjacent to the main car park for the reserves. There you see that, that brown building and there's the inside of it waiting to receive chairs, tables and education material. But what an achievement in a lockdown year that is, to have a truly world-class welcome, a truly great base for all the tools and equipment the wardens need right where they need it. Superb. And there's another one of Matt's geological sections and maps. I'll, I'll shut up about that one now. That's just put on. And there's a bit more signage. A um, little bit of infrastructure. Uh, one of the surprises that came out of last year was money that could have been or should have been spent on ideally on other stuff was washing around. So um, Sandwell put all these new paths into the Bumble Hole Reserve to make the whole part of the lower sites up to the uh, scheduled ancient monument um, wheelchair friendly. So we've got a wheelchair friendly geological trail uh, down at Bumble Hole now, thanks to uh, a bit of thought and, and thoughtful uh, work from the green teams and the rangers of uh, Sandwell. However, I thought I'd just bring uh, one of the strange things that happened in, in, in uh, 2020 uh, to your attention. This is gone now, by the way, but this, this is Barrow Hill. This is the Dudley Volcano site. And um, in, in the site walkover that we were preparing as we were getting back to being able to do field trips again. And we, we walked into the site and found this, this camp in the base of the uh, geological exposures area, um, which I had no idea. And this caused a bit of a rock actually, because we had to get some housing and um, social services to see if we'd got someone who'd been kicked out of the home who was living rough. It turned out to be um, a bunch of blokes who during lockdown had been walking, using the site for walking, saw nobody else was using the site and decided to build themselves a little camp where they could have a campfire at night and drink beer. There, were, there wasn't any mess, but they, but they had created themselves a little outdoor latrine. So, um, so this is what happens when you're looking the other way in some of our geological sites. So needless to say, 
we went in, found out all the detail, we worked out who was there. There was nobody at risk, which was the main thing. We were worried that people might be vulnerable and they might be needing some care and support. It turned out to be a bunch of blokes who were having a great time. So that's all been removed now, taken away. So, But that was a curious little outcome from the last 12 months. Um, finally, on the new knowledge side of things, um, and Colin's here tonight, so if there's questions later, I'll refer him to Colin. We, we've, we've been asked to do a bit more on the educational side and new knowledge. So we're on the process of creating a, a geopark education strategy. And I am unashamedly stealing bits of the um, Jurassic Coast's education strategy for this um, as we speak. Uh, some of it, though, is, is genuinely bespoke for us, the stuff we've learned over the last couple of years. In 2019, we did um, a 45-day apprenticeship uh, scheme using the geological heritage and the geopark to, to inspire creative industries to create films and stories. Uh, this year, we've taken the learning from that skills transfer and upskilling of young people to get them fit for the workplace to to do a prince's trust apprenticeship scheme and we've got the interviews for that happening next week so we're going to take on a dozen or so young people and we're going to give them the outdoor skills so we're going to teach them about the importance of the site and the things to be careful about when you're dealing with heritage sites but also get them uh, professional training on things like chainsaws and networking and stuff like that so that those skills can be ready, for, they can be readily skilled for the industry as it comes. One of the things we know is going to come is change in forestry management through, you know, incidents of um, tree disease and stuff like that. So we hope we're going to get, inspire some of these kids that this is a good career and it's a, a rewarding and fulfilling vocation, but also give them the skills they need to get the foot on the ladder in that vocation. Um, We've formed a subgroup to the Geopark team for research. And uh, literally a few days ago, um, we had a, a subgroup meeting and we defined some objectives and goals. So they are to identify and publicize research opportunities. So if any of you guys out there know of curious questions, worthy research topics that the Geopark could on the landscape scale, look into or find people who might be interested in researching let us know because we're putting together a list of these research opportunities um it's really important that we know what's going on because um again i don't know about you but a lot of the time you don't know that some work's going on so we want to create a list and maintain a list so that we we have a central place where we know who's looking at what and what what new knowledge is coming from where um, on the back of that, that'll generate some new questions, things we're not looking at, things we, we haven't realised is missing from our story. So then we aise with research bodies and get, get things in place to do this research. And then that obligation to share that knowledge with anybody who wants to listen. OK, so the projects we've been looking at previously have been things like monitoring the erosion of rock faces through fixed point photography that also looks at the way vegetation interacts there's a research topic come up with chinese university and the university of Berlin about looking at cyclic sedimentation we're very familiar with it in coal measures rocks but what about in the limestone layers are there repeating cycles there one of the really interesting topics has recently come up is looking at the way in which the way we manage the land, even if the geology is the same, the soils are the same, the climate's the same, how that affects and over what time periods it affects biodiversity. So there's a really interesting project we could do on Castle Hill and Wren's Nest there, and possibly contrast that with Sedgley Beacon or Walsall Arboretum or, or Hayhead. Um, and then, of course, there's the stuff we do, the pure science on things like microfossils. Um, the final topic was networking with the, with the international community. And we, we've actually had quite a few in, incoming inquiries about what we do about things and about, oddly enough, 
people within the network because UNESCO wants English translation. I'm getting, I'm becoming a bit of a translator for geotechy stuff um, for the geoparks. Geopark Amerique in uh, Brittany, uh, developing geopark. They, they send me everything they write now to see if the, the language is okay. So one of, the, one of the weird effects of becoming a geopark is all the geoparks genuinely want your help and advice on things. So that's been very nice. Of course, we've obviously attended a lot of online digital meetings. There's an obligation within the network that we attend two meetings per year, um, international meetings. Uh, this year, we, I've attended eight, um, but I haven't been out of my spare bedroom. So that's been, it's been, the networking side has been freer and better, but the face-to-face -face stuff that's so important is missing. So the networking is happening and there's a lot more of it and it's easier, more easily accessible electronically, but it isn't, in, to my take, the same or the, quite the same quality. The final thing I want to say on this is something we're very proud of in the Black Country Geopark team. Um, this year, the global network decided that we needed a youth forum to represent the views and interests and concerns, ongoing environmental concerns of the young people of the planet. And they, the, the network, the global network, asked all countries with geoparks to offer a youth representative to represent the geoparks in their country. And I, I am absolutely delighted to tell you that Emma, young Emma from the Black Country Consortium, the last uh, sitting next to me in that picture, has, has awarded the position as the UK ambassador for the next two years to the Youth Forum. Her responsibilities and are literally to, to represent geoparks in the UK, the young people's view, but also to do the networking on, on behalf of young people and to report back to us so that the decisions and actions we put in place for the geopark have genuinely got young people in the thought process. So I think that's going to be an absolutely wonderful uh, part to the work as we go forward. And finally, where are we going next? You, I've now told you about what we did in the first year. In some pretty difficult circumstances, I hope you feel that we've achieved a reasonable amount uh, despite the challenges and that we've we've started to put some building blocks in place that really will be strong foundations for the things that come next. So really, what are we going to do next? What are the next steps for the next 12 months? Well, getting that branding out there, we've designed it, we now know what we're doing, we've got the new UNESCO guidance, we can begin to do that. Once we've got that recruited, dedicated team, which will be happening soon, hopefully, we can really begin to fly. One of the things that's been difficult i've felt this a lot it is that a lot of our opportunities the inspirational stuff has been closed down because of the fears of the pandemic so just reopening more of these things and creating more opportunities is going to be wonderful um, and we want to celebrate you know this, we haven't been able to celebrate becoming a, a wonderful global heritage destination we haven't been able to have a party or do anything so there will be something coming i can't tell you what it's going to be and i can't tell you when it's going to be but i, I can tell you that everybody wants to celebrate it's a major achievement for the the black country to become an international uh, heritage destination so we'll be doing something we'll be doing load you'll, you'll see lots of things coming up in individual project basis um there's going to be some new connectivity, and we're going to be strengthening the community and business links. Um, obviously, the metro is going to connect a lot of stuff together. I've got a lot to tell you about that, but that's for the future. And there are developing projects on the way now, using drones to monitor things and get up close and personal map things, LIDAR survey stuff. We'd love to do something with the arts community and to get more of the themed artworks into a single Black Country map because you, you don't have that accessible information source. And when you do get to the artworks, often there's no interpretation at all. 
So I think there's, there's a bit we can do there. The Geopark Way, the long distance footpath connecting all of our sites via the canals, cycling networks and all the rest. Um, and then some works maybe with the nature recovery network to connect a few things together to make things more of a valuable resource for local communities. And finally, finally, the Commonwealth game is coming. And that is going to be our chance to show the United Nations with these 17 objectives for making the world a better place, just what we've been able to deliver with the black country. I'm going to shut up there. So thank you ever so much for tolerating the last 12 months of the geopark with me. Thank you, Graham. Hi. Well, I'm so pleased that we invited you. We, we had this discussion about whether we ought to do this, didn't we? Um, and I, I'm just amazed by how much has gone on. I mean, you know, we've heard the talk about the, the potential geopark several times from you, you know, and, and it was the potential was there, but you've really, you've realized it, haven't you? you began to realize it um, and in, in lots of different senses. And I, I can sense that it's becoming part of the framework of the, of the black country in terms of policy and development and, and so much more. Um, you know, it's almost too much to take in, really. Um, it's complicated. Yeah, yes. But that's, that's how you make it sustainable, I think, by having buy-in from all sorts of different parts of the, of, of the, world, of, of the black country, you know, in, um, from, from business, from people, from you know, local government and, and, and what have you. And, and there's so many prongs to this, aren't there? There's, I'm amazed that there's, there's clearly it's just a small team of you really in the centre um, managing all this. But Well, thank you very much, um, Graham. Um, uh, I'm really pleased that uh, we decided to do this. And thank you everybody for participating. I think um, we'll draw this meeting to a close and I Look forward to seeing you all again uh, on the 15th of November.